There are many ways to prove that you are an American citizen. You could be born to parents of American nationality, or on American soil, or take a test to become a naturalized citizen. But it wasn't always that easy. During the colonial period of the United States, it didn't matter what your origin was because a formal government did not exist. Of course, the colonies were under British rule, so colonists were considered subjects of the king. To become an American today, there is a secure process to protect birth certificates that record and establish our birth rights that go along with being an American citizen. Preserving America will uncover the improbable history of the modern birth certificate and what it means to your rights, privileges, and obligations of citizenship. The birth certificate was born from a tradition that reached the American colonies along with the German immigrants when they arrived in the 17th century. They indirectly influenced the creation of the birth certificate with an art form that was used to record their family ancestry. Any type of birth record that occurred prior to the revolution occurred, most of them occurred in New England in which the towns kept records of whenever somebody was born or somebody died, somebody was married. There are registers up there, and so those are the only type of birth, death, marriage records that exist in colonial times for most of the uh, colonies. Most of the American colonial provinces developed their own naturalization policies outside of English law. These policies were generally accepted as the royal colonial charters did not explicitly grant naturalization to all colonial subjects. In many instances, Citizenship was an expression of the public will provided through the colony's legislative processes. In New England, uh, Massachusetts, if you will, they all came from England where they had been collecting vital records mandated by the king. In 1538, Henry VIII declared that churches would record birth, marriage, and death records. So all of the people from England who settled in New England had that tradition already. And of course, it was done primarily early in the 1630s by the church. But then the towns in New England were mandated to record vital records. So New England is a wealth of wonderful information because we have the town records and the church records. Even under the threat of the British Parliament, the colonies persisted in drafting local laws to fulfill their growing demand for new immigrants until those powers were completely prohibited by the Crown in 1773. When you're getting into um, the Revolutionary War, some of that stopped because you're dealing with differences in government. The government has changing during the uh, Revolution. And then we start with the uh, federal government and the entire federal experience. And the various states would end up um, deciding whether or not to do any type of birth recording. Most of them decided not to do so. One state did, and that was Vermont, apparently has been recording births since the uh, prior to the colonial period. Leading up to the American Revolution, debates over property and political rights exposed a growing belief among the colonists that foreign residents who worked hard toward the common good deserved an equal share as well as citizen rights. The colonists were generally in favor of immigrants as their contributions to the welfare of the colonies were highly valued. It was this environment in the colonies that allowed Americans to examine the concept of allegiance. This also played into the emerging belief in the equality of rights regardless of one's origin. The Declaration of Independence mentioned this in its charges against King George III. It stated that the king has endeavored to prevent the population of these states for that purpose obstructing the laws for the naturalization of foreigners. After the American Revolution was over, the Articles of Confederation stated that each colony could independently pass its own naturalization laws. As a result, the new American states produced capricious naturalization laws and requirements. However, certain assumptions were made, including affirming allegiance to an authority, 
and a mandatory period of physical residence prior to obtaining the right of citizenship. The Constitution, which did not address naturalization but acknowledged the lack of legal uniformity under the Articles of Confederation, unfortunately, policies and procedures were not developed at the federal level until 1952. Previously, colonies and states levied their own form of documenting the naturalization and birth rights of its citizens. I think there was a lot more trust back in the 17th and, and 18th century. If somebody came in to record a deed, usually both parties came in. The government would accept that these parties are definitely saying, I received money from the first person. And likewise with the, the church, although the minister certainly would know his parishioners and would know that that baby being brought in to be christened belonged to that couple. There wasn't the, the huge question there might be today to prove that what you are doing is really legal. In medieval European cities and villages, births were recorded by the church who maintained a simple register, a practice that was imported to the colonies by the Quakers and pilgrims and continued until the 20th century. However, the real purpose of the register was to track property transactions. I think the correlation is not only just between the birth certificates and immigration, you also have the correlation between immigration and I think the linear societies all being founded about that time to prove that you were an American. Um, and, you know, there is that, um, you know, that document there that will prove that you are actually born in America, that you are an American citizen, that you are not a foreigner who just you know, immigrated into this country. Uh, so I think that's part of the reason for the, the rise of birth certificates. Um, of the uh, 50 states, uh, 31 states passed some sort of vital records law between about 1900 and 1923. From a genealogist standpoint, this is where we run into difficulties because uh, each state has its own policy. There's no federal policy um, regarding issuance of birth certificates. It's strictly a st state function. And the states all have different varying um, laws rela relating to the information which might be available. Because birth, you know, the recording of birth and deaths is strictly a state function and not a federal function. Churches would keep records as a means of tracking births, marriages, and deaths. In 1682, the Pennsylvania colony established a law requiring records to be kept of all births and deaths of the inhabitants of the colony. Although these vital statistics were recorded in registers by local churches or town clerks, they lacked any sort of consistency and enforcement. It was a religious function primarily now in 16. 82, there was a law on the books when Pennsylvania was first created to maintain vital records. However, it was not enforced. Conjecture might suggest that because these were all religious men who were running Pennsylvania government at that time and knew that the churches, Quakers, friends primarily were maintaining birth, marriage, and death records, they might have decided they did not have to enforce that law. So the Quaker records are absolutely the best for Pennsylvania beginning in, well, actually in 1680 for their New Jersey records. During the American colonial period, there simply wasn't a government administration or nearby church to properly record births and deaths. So it was left up to the local communities and families to document these important events. Well, the family Bible was, of course, very important. Most families had them. Not everybody could afford them. Not everybody could read. So not everybody had a Bible. But those who had them would enter the information, absolutely. And those are treasured by researchers today as an original record. When the American Revolutionary War began, much of the recording of births stopped. Record keeping was so bad that only half of the births and deaths were properly recorded in Massachusetts before 1842. However, there were exceptions. It's not until the 1840s that you start finding um, states thinking about 
uh, having birth records or death records. The one exception is the city of Philadelphia decided as early as 1803 to start keeping death records. I think part of the reason for it was that this city has been uh, hit several times during the colonial period and the 1790s by yellow fever epidemics. So there was a question of keeping an eye on uh, mortality rates and also what was causing these deaths. Life was hard in 18th century America. It was not unheard of for a woman having an average of five children during their lifetime. If she died, the father would likely remarry. This created a need to document the family tree as the household expanded. In many cases, the pastor wasn't easily accessible because he lived in another state or jurisdiction, and they had to wait until he came to the area to conduct the marriage service. When they started settling the frontier in Pennsylvania, itinerant ministers would travel around, absolutely, and people would get married as, as they could when somebody was going to be in the area. Yes, there was much, much of that as they pushed westward and were living uh, very remotely, so they would get married by whatever religious minister happened to come into the area. In Germany, some state officials tried to control population growth by setting a legal restriction on marriage to make it more difficult to achieve. As a result, the peasant society created customs separate from the traditions of the church, which would later have a direct impact upon early colonial history. As Germans immigrated to the American colonies, a large population settled in southeastern Pennsylvania. They were primarily from Lutheran and Reformed German families. German-speaking people immigrated from Europe for a variety of reasons. The Lutherans and the German Reformed, who were um, the vast majority of the immigrants, came primarily for economic opportunities. But then there was a whole range of other groups, including the Mennonites, the Schwankfelders, the Moravians, and, and other smaller religious sects that came because of religious persecution in Europe, that they were welcome in Pennsylvania due to William Penn's policies of religious tolerance. And so they could practice their religions here, but also find economic opportunity with, the, with land in Pennsylvania. These immigrants brought a range of traditions with them, including, first of all, many different German dialects. Um, there wasn't a unified German language that they brought. They also brought distinctive architectural practices with them, and then especially their decorative arts. Everything from particular types of furniture and techniques of decoration to pottery, and of course the fraktur or the decorated manuscript arts. They also imported an art form to document births, baptisms, deaths, and marriages. It was an art form deeply rooted in German medieval manuscript art or lettering known as Fraktur. It was a German typeface that was primarily used from the 15th century until World War II. Fraktur at its most basic is derived from a Latin word referring to uh, the fractured or broken style of the lettering. Fraktur in the original, the earliest sense, was basically a typeface used in German-speaking areas of Europe, and then there was a manuscript style of lettering derived from that typeface. So in Europe, if you were to look or ask to see a Fraktur, you could be shown anything really printed in that typeface. But in America, the term Fraktur has been applied, um, beginning in the 20th century especially, to this distinctive genre of decorative uh, works of art on paper, including all types of certificates and other documents. American Fracture was a reflection of the European tradition of illuminated manuscripts. Artists would take a mechanically printed piece and then add elaborate hand-drawn swirls or scrolls as decorative art. This process maintained the illuminated manuscript tradition from the Middle Ages. Fracture was used for a variety of purposes, the most common type was the birth or, and baptismal certificate, and this was especially popular with the Lutherans and the German Reformed. Um, and in that church, baptism was a particularly significant religious rite of passage, and so they would produce these documents to commemorate that. Fraktur drawings were executed by mostly male teachers and their students by hand, utilizing ink and watercolor. 
Fractura were found in a wide variety of forms, such as writing samples, birth and baptismal certificates, marriage and house blessings, book plates, and figurative scenes. Other groups of the Pennsylvania Germans, such as the Mennonites and the Schwangfelders, did not practice infant baptism, and so they developed different types of fraktur, uh, things related to the educational system, such as writing samples and alphabets. Also, fraktur was used for book plates to identify ownership of the books, and it was also used often um, as kind of a gift that people might commission a New Year's greeting, for example, to give to a neighbor or a friend. There were love letters that were exchanged. Um, there, there really was a large variety of fraktur, but with that birth and baptismal certificate being the primary example. Most of the fraktur artists were men, and they tended to be schoolmasters or ministers because those people had the necessary education to make these documents. They were, of course, literate, um, but they also had access to the clients. If you were a minister, you were baptizing children, you could make these certificates as a, perhaps a bit of a side business. If you were a schoolmaster, making writing samples and things for your pupils made a, a great deal of sense. The kind of interesting thing that begins to happen is that as one schoolmaster teaches his students to, to write like him, to copy his writing with these certificates, you get a couple of those students then, perhaps in the next generation, who are very good at copying their teacher's work. And before you know it, you get these sort of regional schools developing um, that really grew out of one particular artist's influence. Most American fracture were created between 1740 and 1860. The first fracture created in North America was drawn by artists around 1750 at the Ephrata Cloister, about 30 miles west of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Early fracture produced at the cloister was created with inks, paints, and paper. The earliest fracture in America um, that we know of begin in the 1740s at the Ephrata Cloister in Lancaster County. But by the 1760s, we're starting to see some uh, totally manuscript, handwritten um, birth and baptismal certificates. It's not until the 1780s that we begin to see um, printing of these certificates begin. And, and that starts at the Ephrata Cloister where they had a printing press. The artists were trying to keep up with demand, and so printed certificates were very practical and efficient. They could add hand-applied uh, color to them, watercolor decoration, and sort of fill in the blanks with the genealogical data. Um, but we also see them starting to use woodblock stamps that they would add embellishment to the certificates with them, um, you know, all ways of sort of mechanizing or speeding up the process to, to keep up with demand. Birth and baptismal certificates were later made by well-known clerks or scriveners who traveled from town to town demonstrating their penmanship and creative flair on ready-made certificates or templates. Several particularly well-known fracture artists, and there are, there are dozens who we have distinctive bodies of work, but we don't know the names, perhaps, of the makers. One of the real sort of founding fathers of fracture, if you will, is a, a German immigrant named Heinrich Otto who came from Germany, settled in Berks County, Pennsylvania, first as a weaver, but then became a schoolmaster. And he was one of the first to use those printed certificates from Ephrata, but also was making absolutely gorgeous, um, elaborate manuscript certificates for young people. And he trained a number of his sons, actually, to follow him in Fraktur production. And so four of his sons are known to be Fraktur artists as well. The treasures of Fraktur are the intricate hand-drawn birth certificates and book plates made by skilled artists. So here we have a very particular type of Fraktur, a very rare one known as a metamorphosis. And this four-part booklet uh, was made by the schoolmaster Durs Rudy, who worked in Lehigh County. He uh, immigrated from Germany in 1803, but soon settled in Lehigh County. And basically what this booklet is, was it was intended for the sort of religious instruction of children, that they could manipulate these flaps and change the scenes and follow this story. And because the original is very pristine and we want to keep it in that condition, I have this mock-up one here so that you can see how the paper was attached and that through these flaps one can lift the top or lower the bottom to change the scene. 
We have a, a sample one here in full color of the last booklet in the series. And so as the, as the story progresses, it goes from Adam to Eve, and then it talks about the um, crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. It has a, a young man who turns into a skeleton, sort of reminding us to always be prepared for death. And then the final scene, we see this young man here, and here he is reading, perhaps from the Bible, to a, a young woman. And then we lift the top flap, and that tree turns into having the angels flying by it. And then as we lower it now, we see that the young man is here in Jerusalem and that he's now received the crown of life from the angels. And then at the bottom it's signed, Durs Rudy, the artist, and dated 1832. Fraktura was created by all of the Pennsylvania German groups, including the Amish, Mennonite, Reformed and Lutherans, and the Schwenkfelders. Another particularly influential artist was a man named Johann Adam Eyer, who was actually a Lutheran, um, but he taught school in the Mennonite school system primarily in Bucks and Montgomery counties in Pennsylvania. But Iyer was one of those highly influential schoolmasters who taught generations of students uh, to follow in his footsteps. And so one has to be very careful in distinguishing their work. You have to really look at the subtleties of the handwriting um, to, to try to figure out whether it's Iyer or one of his students that you're looking at. As hand-drawn art of Fraktur began to dissipate, the printed form began to evolve. Writing samples were relegated to Bibles and chests and blank certificates were printed by the thousands to supply the Pennsylvania German public consumption. When trying to make attributions of works to particular artists, what I think is most important is to have a, if you can, a signed piece of work by that artist that you're focusing on. And so there are one or two pieces that are clearly signed, made by Johann Ademeyer or, or others and to use that as sort of a benchmark to compare. Um, and it, it's like being a forensic handwriting analyst and trying to look at you know, every detail of you know, how do they form their lowercase g's or you know, how do they end their sentences? Is it with a particular flourish or you know, more plainly? And, and just really studying it very, very closely. Fraktura was not only a creative and instrumental method to record births and marriages, but as the Revolutionary War ended, many Pennsylvanian widows used fracture documents to prove they were married to a deceased American Continental soldier to receive his pension. The fracture birth and baptismal certificates really began in America as a way of not only commemorating the importance of baptism, but also really a way of recording personal data. In, in Europe, where church and state were one, there was a very official system of recording birth dates, recording baptismal dates, marriages, all of that information. In colonial Pennsylvania, there was not that same system, particularly in the 18th century, before things really, uh, before settlement really progressed. And so, in, in part, these birth and baptismal certificates that we see being made are actually quite different from those in Germany because they, they really include a lot of genealogical data. They have the parents' names, the, often the mother's maiden name, the date of birth, of course the child's name, um, in addition to that baptismal information. And so it, it's really a way of capturing all, all of this information absent an official state or, or very organized church system for doing it. And so I think there is certainly the potential that the kind of modern birth certificate that we all know today in many ways may have evolved out of this practice or this penchant for recording personal information um, and, and commemorating it in some kind of certificate or document form. One example of how the Fraktur birth and baptismal certificates uh, were used to establish this sort of official identity is that following the American Revolution, there were actually widows or family members, heirs, who would actually submitted birth and baptismal certificates made in this Fraktur tradition um, to the war board or the, the government entity as, as proof of age for collecting Revolutionary War pensions. Other records were also used to prove citizenship if a widow or soldier did not have proof of their identity. When you get back into the 19th century and you're talking pension records, um, Revolutionary War pension records to prove who you are, you know, you know, what was your birth date or whatever, 
you would have to rely upon other type of records and they would have to be like ecclesiastical records, the church records that are out there. Also family Bibles. Family Bibles are an important resource for recording births, deaths, and marriages within a family. And so a lot of times, both for the, uh, the Revolutionary War pension applications, for the War of 1812 pension applications, and for the Civil War pension applications, that you would have to have, you know, somebody would come in with documents uh, that were created as part of you know, normal day-to-day -day life, but not a government-issued document. Out of this tradition, various laws were eventually created in the late 19th and early 20th centuries to modernize and centralize the recording of births, deaths, and marriages in Pennsylvania. But that too came with its own set of problems. The United States did not have a national registration system for births and deaths because the Constitution left the responsibility up to the individual states. 1906 law for Pennsylvania, which um, probably has some rationale behind it, why they started keeping um, the birth death uh, records at a statewide level. I don't know also that the state was very upset at the um, response that the counties were making in, for the 1892 law. So they wanted to have some sort of state supervision over the um, process. And then in 1915, they ended up taking, uh, passing that law word for word, exactly the same as the 1906 law with the exception of six words, which the six words essentially eliminated any type of county recording in Pennsylvania and became solely a state function. Prior to the United States becoming a sovereign nation, registration of births, deaths, and marriages was a function left to religious entities. In 1682, Pennsylvania created one of the first laws requiring the colony to document and maintain vital records, but they did not enforce it very well. This really had to do with land. People needed to know who was related to who, who was descended from who, for property and land reasons, so that somebody couldn't just walk in and say, I am the son of Samuel Winslow, let's say, so I am entitled to inherit his property. Every town official could not know everybody that lived in a town. So you maintained records largely to document family relationships. The importance of the birth certificate cannot be understated. It is the most important document in a citizen's life and ancestry. A birth certificate is very important for um, because that is the record which is made at the time of the birth. So therefore the information should be uh, as accurate as possible regarding the name of the person, which is not, could be changed any time after that, the date of the birth, and also the parents' names. Um, because a lot of this is um, trying to connect children with their parents there is also a correlation between the formal creation of the birth certificate in the 20th century with the rise of immigrants coming into the country. The passage of vital record laws and lineage societies were developed as immigrants wanted to prove they too were Americans as a way to be quickly assimilated and accepted into society. When you talk about lineage societies, and the lineage societies um, in America, a lot of them started in the 1880s, 1890s, and so there may have been a play, you know, a, a um, influence by the Linnean societies for this as well. And of course, today, you know, 100 plus years later, uh, anybody, any genealogist who is working on Linnean societies, of course, loves the birth certificates because they give that connection between uh, parents and child. Death certificates were not as accurate because the information was provided by someone who may not know all the details of the deceased. You know, what, for death certificates, death certificates are based upon the informa some informant giving that information to the funeral director who types up the death certificate, and that information may not be completely accurate. Prior to the creation of the formal birth certificate, any American applying to the Social Security Administration for a pension was forced to use the American census as an alternate birth certificate to prove who they were. Other records, such as church records or family Bibles, were also used to prove one's identity in order to get a pension.
that's where the census comes into play. And this is something during the 1930s with the advent of Social Security. And you had all these people who were 65 years old and older who were going on Social Security and they had no documentation for when they were born. So the Census Bureau during the 1930s actually started to index the various censuses, the 1920, the 1910, the 1900, um, and the 1880 census. And the 1880 census, they only index for families with children 10 years old and younger. And it was not an every family index. Uh, and it was primarily so people could use the census as an alternate birth certificate. There is one exception where the federal government would create and maintain a birth record for an American citizen. The National Archives has records of the federal government and they do not have any birth records um, except possibly um, that the only birth records of any type that are uh, created by the federal government are by the Department of State for um, American citizens born overseas or born outside the country, then they will create a birth certificate for that individual. Of course, there have been some cases of fraud. There was a naturalization case in 1840 where three people were naturalized with the same declaration of intention. Just mentioning to um, a class a little while ago uh, about a naturalization case that occurred in the 1840s in which I discovered that um, three people were naturalized uh, with the same declaration of intention. Two of, the, two of the declarations were fraudulent and one was uh, legit. So there's a lot of fraud you know, that was being played and a lot of records, not just birth certificates, but other type of records throughout the 19th century. And I think that's where you run into more um, the various states saying they wanted to have a more accurate document to uh, prove personal identity. Between the 1840s and 1860s, fraud also occurred in various elections where voters tried to pad voting lists. In terms of fraud for um, birth certificates, no. I've, I've run across a couple cases for fraudulent naturalizations um, then the, um, in the 1850s and 1860s in which uh, people were caught with those fraudulent naturalizations and they had to be uh, voided, and, but there were court cases that went. In fact, actually, the 1840, um, that entire election of 1840 was so, the, the uh, typical new in Tyler II, William Henry Harrison, was so um, fought, by, you know, politically fought to the point that uh, there were over 100 uh, fraudulent declarations of intention that were created in the Philadelphia Court of Sessions Court that were created and backdated and then pasted into a, into a decoration volume over there. And somebody spotted it all and they had to void all 100 or whatever number there were of these fraudulent decorations. The reason for it was that they were trying to pad the voting list. Naturalizations in the 19th century were a very extraordinary political process at the time. Naturalizations usually take place in September or October of an election year, just before November voting. Remember, naturalization during the 19th century is a very highly political process. And it is, um, most of your naturalizations in the 19th century take place um, usually in September and October of the year. And then also that you have peak points at the major naturalization years or presidential election years. In 1952, when the United States naturalization law was born as a uniform rule of naturalization created as part of the Immigration and Nationality Act, it states that Congress shall have the power to establish a uniform rule of naturalization. The act set forth the legal requirements for the acquisition of and divestiture from American nationality. The requirements have become more explicit since the ratification of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. The 14th Amendment was adopted on July 9, 1868, after the Civil War, as one of the Reconstruction Amendments. The amendment addresses citizenship rights and equal protection of the laws, and was proposed in response to issues related to former slaves. 
Section 1 of the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution states, All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. A person becomes a citizen of the United States at the time of birth by virtue of the first clause of the 14th Amendment stating a person must be born in the United States, has parents that are subjects of a foreign power, but not in any diplomatic or official capacity of that foreign power, or has parents that have permanent domicile and residence in the United States. In the modern world, most countries have laws that regulate the registration of births. There is one commonality among all countries. It is the responsibility of the mother's physician, midwife, hospital administrator, or the parents of the child to see that the birth is properly registered and recorded with the proper government agency. The registration of that birth provides each child rights as a citizen of his or her country and all of the government benefits that go with it. The Articles of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of a Child states every child has a right to a name and nationality, and it is the responsibility of national governments to ensure this right, asserting that the child shall be registered immediately at birth and shall have the right from birth to a name and to acquire a nationality. Becoming a citizen is a status recognized under law as being a legal member of a sovereign state or belonging to a nation. A birth certificate may be a small paper document, but its tradition and history establishes who you are and provides access to the rights, privileges, and obligations of citizenship.